Good morning. I'm Jackie Weaver, and I am the digital art and time-based media professor in the art department at the College of DuPage. Um, welcome to our second of seven events in our 2020-2021 Visiting Artists Series. Um, this series is a collaboration between the Cleve Kearney Museum of Art and the Departments of Art, Architecture, and Photography at the College of DuPage. Second artist today, Trevor Paglin. Trevor is an artist, geographer, writer, and MacArthur Fellow whose work is often described as pioneering. Engaging traditions of landscape painting and photography, his work includes distant photographs of secret government sites and satellites, radioactive sculpture created for Fukushima's exclusion zone, satellites launched into space in collaboration with Creative Time and MIT as part of his Impossible Object series, and contributions to the Academy Award-winning film, Citizen Four. More recently, his work investigates the politics and ethics of AI and machine vision. His work and writing pose questions about our material relationship with the world, what it looks like to create new spaces as a practice of freedom, what it means to cultivate an ethical relationship with time and technology, how to mourn within a sense of fragility and remoteness of our present moment, and how to imagine alternative futures. Trevor's work is included in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York, among others. Trevor holds a BA from UC Berkeley, an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and a PhD in geography from UC Berkeley. Trevor has three exhibitions happening concurrently right now, Bloom at Pace Gallery in London, and that is up through November, Opposing Geometries at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, which is up through March, and Unseen Stars at OGR in Turin, which is up through January. Um, and even if you can't travel to these particular locations to see the work, I highly recommend that you check out the websites for these um, exhibitions. Uh, Bloom in particular uh, allows you to, to view the show remotely um, and even to stream yourself in through one of Trevor's works called Octopus. Um, so as you're viewing the space, people in the exhibition space can actually see you up on the screen. Trevor, we're really happy to have you here today. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me today. It's great to um, meet you. And that was a, um, a very beautiful and, and um, comprehensive introduction. So um, thank you for that. So for those of you who were listening in, if you could just put your questions in the Q&A chat box. Trevor, while we're waiting um, for those couple of questions to come in, um, I wonder if you might just talk a little bit about um, maybe some of the legality of these projects you're working on and any pushback that you receive, maybe from developers or government agencies. Has there been any sort of pushback like as you're questioning these, um, these different structures of surveillance and um, machine vision? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I'm criticizing a lot of research that people have put a lot of work into and, you know, really spent big parts of their lives doing. And I, and I think that that's hard, you know, and I think, you know, some people will, can have reasonable conversations about that and some people can't, you know, and particularly when you're looking at technology, these are not just things that are taking place inside computer science labs, but these are often industries that have billions and billions of dollars associated with them, you know? There has been a lot of pushback with, with different projects from different ways. And I think that is fine. Um, I think that is kind of necessary. And I think it's good to be able to have these kinds of conversations um, because I think for too long, um, 
the work in fields like AI and like computer science has been of a highly political nature and of a highly kind of, um, uh, of a nature that has very, very serious like implications for the structure of society itself. And that there needs to be more people in those rooms having those conversations and questioning the assumptions that a lot of these uh, different fields and technologies are built upon. So um, I, I think it's great <laughs> you know, too. Sure. And, and if that's a little bit antagonistic at times, that's fine. Sure. Okay, um, a couple of questions popping in. Um, question from Michael. Could you speak a little to the politics of these surveillance systems and the data sets as a sort of discipline or control, um, i.e. Foucault's interpretations of the panopticon? Okay. Um, so yeah, there is, I think there is, you can use the framework of the panopticon to think about that. And, and I think this can be a, a, a good framework in part. Um, and the, the idea of the panopticon is a little bit one of these allegorical ideas, but I think the way that I think about it is that it stands in for the idea that when you know you're being watched that you behave differently. Right. And so when you think about that at scale, when we all know that we're being watched and that the ways in which we act will be used against us, we behave differently. And it, it strongly encourages, you know, much more conformist kind of society. Right. And it um, and that becomes more and more um, pervasive the more and more we build technologies that monitor the intimate parts of our lives, you know, that are monitoring our sleep, that are monitoring, that monitoring the amount of exercise that we're doing and that sort of thing, because that has consequences. And insurance companies are, you know, the whole model of, you know, the next generation of insurance is that you, know, you don't have an insurance policy anymore. You have a, like a fitness tracker and you have a camera in your car that watches you drive and your insurance is being continually modulated by whether or not the AI systems built into those devices think that you're behaving in a way that are um, that they approve of, right? So that that so add that up to the scale of a society, and you you are actively shaping how people people act. You are promoting certain kinds of behavior at the expense of others. So that that's that panoptic side of it. But I think that another way that I think about it a little bit more is within a kind of colonial context and thinking about sensing devices, surveillance devices, whatever you want to, however you want to think about them as being increasingly inserted into spaces that were previously too inefficient to insert policing or capital into, you know, for example, bedrooms, gyms, you know, your car while you're driving, et cetera, and opening up all kinds of places that were previously inaccessible to those kinds of um, political and economic forces and making them now available. And so you can't for extractive, you know, uh, purposes, right? So your, your body, literally the, you know, the biology of your, of your body, like what you do in your free time is now subject to, to capitalism, basically to a uh, two people, you know, extracting, you know, money from in, in all kinds of different ways. And of course, then on the other side is, is uh, increasingly subject to policing as well. To me, that's a little bit more of a productive way than the kind of classic uh, panoptic way of thinking about surveillance, but I think both of them are, are, are useful. Another question that we have um, from Ari. What is the most unforgettable moment you've had while making your art or doing research for your art? Mm, I have had so many. <laughs> like I don't. Know. Um, I think I think the fun thing about making art, or the way that I approach making art, is I do a lot of empirical work. So I don't go into the studio every day and then like throw together some work of genius or whatever. It's very, there's a lot of research involved. There's a lot of uh, diligence involved. There's a lot of rigor involved. And there's a lot of 
there's a lot of work in the, in the way that I make art. There's a lot of work that goes into putting yourself in the position to be able to see something um, if indeed there turns out that there's going to be something to be able to see. So for, what, for example, what I mean by that is when I started thinking about, oh, I want to photograph undersea cables as a way to try to think about the internet differently or thinking about the ocean differently as a landscape. I didn't know that that was necessarily impossible to do, but in order to figure out whether it was impossible to do, you have to learn how to scuba dive, you have to learn something about underwater navigation and bathymetry, you have to learn all of this stuff. And then you have to go to, you have to rent a boat and go diving. You have to do all of this stuff in order to put yourself in the position to see something, if indeed it's possible to see, and you don't know that before trying it out. So those moments where you've done all of this work to try to see something, and then you're like, oh, and now you see this thing that um, few people have seen before you, if anyone, um, is always really exciting, you know, um, because on one hand, it's exciting because your work paid off, but it's also exciting because it makes you see the world around you differently. And I think for me, that's one of the most exciting things art can do. So I also noticed that when you were showing us some of those images at the beginning, um, you were showing us moments of you doing the thing or preparing <laughs> to do the thing. So is there like a performative aspect to the work for you? Do you think of it in those terms at all? For sure, for sure. I, and I think about, um, you know, it's like for me, there's like where the frame of the artwork ends and where the world begins is completely blurry <laughs> and, um, and, they, and they really just bleed completely into one another um, to the point where even giving like a, you know, a presentation like this, it feels really artificial to say, okay, now here's the artwork and here's like the stuff that's behind the artwork, all of these things in my mind and practice kind of flow seamlessly from one to the next. Um, another question, this one from Brianna. Uh, what would you say is one of your favorite works so far? And then she also asks, do you think it's possible for AI to advance over time to make accurate to perfect facial expression recognition and judgments of who a person in the image is? Mm -hmm. Um, so in my favorite works of, I don't know if that's of my art or of, um, art in the world, but I think the art that I'm looking at is always changing based on, um, based on what I'm thinking about. And I think I get different things out of, you know, different, um, Yeah, so I, I would never say like, oh, this is like the one artwork that is the thing that keeps on giving, but there are there are certain touchstones. I mean, I, I think about abstract art a lot from a lot of different perspectives. I mean, so that's like something I kind of, I'm always getting interested in, like kind of going back and forth with. Um, I do that a lot with, um, with Dürer, <laughs> you know, for example, I'm looking at, you know, like some like, pre-Renaissance and Baroque, um, like allegorical kinds of images. Um, and that is, you know, something I'm constantly going back and forth with. Um, uh, cave art, you know, um, it's another one. Those are just endlessly interesting to me in terms of being examples of images that have been kind of radically detached from history. So as like kind of case studies of like, what is an image when you completely strip historical context away from it. Um, so there's different kinds of images and different kinds of artworks that, um, that are kind of endlessly fascinating <laughs> to me for those different kinds of reasons. Um, in terms of AI advancing over time to make accurate to perfect facial expression. Routine. So it depends on what we mean by that. So I think facial recognition, like in terms of like identifying somebody, like somebody's identity by looking at their face is getting better all the time. Um, and in places like China in particular, it's being combined with other kinds of technology to really do precise surveillance. So you can combine 
facial recognition with, for example, systems that identify different kinds of clothes, different cars, different locations, and you can use multiple kind of overlapping forms of uh, computer vision and identification technologies to, you know, very, yeah, to absolutely identify who different people are in different places with, um, with pretty high accuracy. Now, that is not to say that these things fail all the time and have put people in prison that don't belong in prison, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't think that that is the right question, I guess. For me, the right question is to ask what, who is benefiting from these forms of technology and the forms of power built into them? And do we want to have a society in which those forms are of power are being optimized? Because they're always going to be optimized at the expense of somewhere else. Um, so that's, I think that's one answer to your question. The second part of your question, I think I understood is going more in the uh, phrenological vein in terms of the judgment of who a person in the image is like. So the identification of a person, sure, but a judgment of them is, no, I don't think that there can be perfect judgment because judgment itself is not a neutral thing. Like that, 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 that a judgment always comes from a place of somebody's values. Right. Um, there's no, there, I, there can never be a neutral evaluation of a person. And on one hand, so that's one philosophical answer to that. The other side of the philosoph philosophy is, can you learn something about somebody by looking at an image of them? And I think, no, basically no. <laughs> you know, so, I um, mean, I think it's pseudoscientific to, to imagine that we can. Sure. Um, David is noticing the flag on the wall behind you, and he asked yeah. if you could talk about that at all. <laughs> yeah, it's um, that is it, it's a leftover from a project many years ago that I did at the Hague, um, where I had made flags of of logos of different American, basically global surveillance programs, and so this was uh, the one. Uh, that's on that flag is a big picture of an octopus that was the logo for a spy satellite and it says nothing is beyond our reach and uh, that's that's basically what it is. Um, our last question here, um, what does this tell us about the way we view privacy and how it relates to government? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I don't really put a lot of stock in the concept of privacy in, in, in and of itself. And because the, I, what I think is hard about the concept of privacy, it's very individualistic. Like it leaves it up to me to decide what I want to be private and what I do not want to be private. And I think that if we think about privacy, it starts to tempt us into thinking about things like data collection as something that I either can or cannot opt in or out of, or something that I choose to opt in or out of, or something that the solution to you know, any problems associated with it should be at the scale of an individual. In other words, we should allow people to have control over their data. That can be very quickly the conclusion that you come to if you frame data collection and analysis as a question of privacy. Instead, I like to use the concept of anonymity and thinking about anonymity, not as individual anonymity, but thinking about anonymity as a public resource, right? And could imagine that having sectors of our society that are relatively um, off limits in terms of surveillance or policing or data collection or marketing or what have you creates possible places where we can imagine different ways of being you know if he, if j edgar hoover had facebook what would the civil rights movement have looked like it would have looked very differently right um and and i guess the point that i'm making is that we gain a lot as a society by creating places that are relatively free from policing and relatively free from uh, corporate forms of data collection and monitoring. And that is 
something that I think we need to take seriously as a resource. Um, I did see one more question come in here. Uh, do you plan to or have you thought about collaborating with other artists and individuals who work with technological media as their medium? Yeah, so I work with tons and tons of different people. I work a lot with people basically who are experts about stuff that I don't know about, <laughs> you know, which, and so that's, it's a huge part of, of, of what I do and with, with every project, you know, so if we're, if you're going diving and trying to figure that out, yeah, I'm collaborating with people that know how to dive and do underwater, you know, survey, survey surveying and that sort of thing. Um, and with a lot of the AI, AI work, I've collaborated a lot with a good friend of mine named Kate Crawford, who was, um, basically, you know, somebody who researches the social and political implications of, you know, big, you know, big data systems. Um, so, you know, collaboration is, is everywhere in, in, in everything that I do. And I think that's, um, you know, how, how, I, I don't think that's unusual. I think that's like generally how people working with this material have to work. Well, thank you so much, Trevor. Um, we really appreciate you being here with us, taking the time to talk about your work and answer some questions. Um, our next visiting artist event um, is going to be Mary Mattingly's lecture, and that will be Wednesday, October 28th at 11 a.m. CST. And then the following conversation will be between um, art historian Darby English and artist Ayana Moore. That will be Tuesday, November 10th at 1 p.m. So thank you for everyone who participated in today's talk. Thanks for the questions in the chat. Um, we really appreciate all of that. And thanks so much. We'll see you at the next event.